He knows that this, this, that's true. So. Oh. You're good? Um, sometimes, it, you know, when we, we're talking through this whole thing, you know, when God speaks and, and the prophetic or words of knowledge and all of that, it, sometimes it's just easier not to go there. You know, when someone comes down and stands next to whoever's sitting, I'll just let everyone, whoever's sitting in that seat where Andrea is now, <laughs> it's like, it's like the seat, the seat. You nearly have to just go, the seat in inverted commas. It's just that person's on service kind of leading for the day. So if you have something you want to share, um, you know, you think God's speaking, just come down and whisper. Just whisper in our ear what you want to share. And, and all that is is just to provide a bit of safety. Um, I've been in meetings before where, how do you do it delicately? <laughs> Some of the, the prophetic things that people want to share is sometimes it's actually quite personal for them. Yeah. And God has spoken. There's no doubt about that. But God's actually speaking to them. It's not the sort of thing that you want to air publicly. Yeah. You know, like I, I really feel God wants, wants everyone to have $50. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, God's saying that to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was only joking, but you know what I mean. So if you want to say something, come and do that. Hey, uh, I want to continue on speaking about unconditional. So two weeks ago I started, um, and uh, I just kind of, I didn't really unpack what unconditional meant. I was all really wrapped up in this thing around this unconditional faith. But what I want to do today is I want to talk about the things that seem to be unconditional for us, but let me clarify us. All right? Now, when I say that, I, I'm talking about those who have accepted Christ Jesus into their lives. Now, personally, I, I, I never want to talk and get caught in, in religious ga- uh, jargon. You know what I mean? I don't want to get caught and use big words and big thoughts and big phrases, which, you know, we might understand, we may not. I want to be as simple and as down to earth as possible. That's just me. If you have a problem with that, I apologize. But I, I want to make sure that the words we communicate are actually understood. But, yes, God? <laughs> they did say it was going to get windy today, so obviously it is. If there's tons of fires, we're in for a great morning. I'll just put it, put it out there. So what I want to do is I just want to unpack that. I know, I know. See, it's like, woo! We're loving God and loving people. Woo! You know? Um, Online, this will make no sense at all. I'm sorry. It's super windy and the side screens are bouncing everywhere. Done. Makes a lot more sense. I just want to unpack this statement about those who have accepted Christ, Jesus, in their lives. Now, like I said, I don't want to use big jar. I don't want to talk about, but I think we need to actually unpack this because I'm not talking about those who go to church. All right? I'm not talking about those who were born into a religious family. The amount of people that I've talked to, I said, "Hey, you know, oh, you know, what, what do you what do you think about God? Oh, I'm Catholic." It's like that's not even the question I asked. <laughs> or you know, I was confirmed, I was baptized. This is a child. I'm not talking about that. All right, I, I, I'm just absolutely not. Um, what I'm talking about when I say they've accepted Jesus Christ into their lives, what I mean is they have a personal relationship with Jesus. That it's not just a, a religious expression. It's not that they're just doing the things they need to do. It means that on a, on a daily kind of intimate point, they connect with God. So when we start to say that these things are unconditional, I'm not talking about those who go to church. I've heard it said before, you can go to McDonald's as many times as you want, you're never going to be a hamburger. <laughs> All right? You can sit in a car garage all day and you're just not going to turn into a car. You can be here every week, week in, week out, and not be a Christian. Now, another way I've heard it, and I'm really, 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 I hate using the term, is oh, I'm only referring to serious Christians now. <laughs> you know, I've heard, that, I've heard that preach before, and I'm thinking, I'm sure God doesn't have, like, classifications. You're like, you're... Well, you're kind of just kind of an ordinary Christian, but then up here, there's the gold class seating in heaven. 
where the serious Christians live. You know what I mean? I, there's, there's only Christians. I, don't think, I, I think God just sees those who are his and those who are not. So when I'm talking about this unconditional kind of stuff that happens in our life, I'm talking about those who have that relationship with Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to be offensive, as I can easily do without even meaning to normally. What I'm trying to say is I just want you to understand that if that's you in that space, then there's things happening in your life which you have no control over. That's good, isn't it? I don't know, is it good? It could be. Well, let's unpack it a little bit more. So the word unconditional, let's look at this. It actually means without conditions or limitations. All right? Um, other words to describe unconditional are this. Absolute, full, complete, outright, unrestricted, entire, and total. Now, if we put that into the context of following Christ, what it does, I think it actually reveals the true nature of a disciple really well. It explains what our lives should be, you know, where um, we're someone who has given our life to Christ and there's no conditions. You know, we don't come to Jesus and say, hey, I'll follow you if. Or I'll continue to do what you say when you. You know what I mean? There's no limitations, there's no conditions. We're not coming to Christ with our own agenda, you know, but we're saying, God, I'll follow you without limitation. Regardless of the circumstances, God, whatever you want, I'm here. That's good? I reckon that's tough. Might be good, but I reckon that's a really hard thing to out, outwork in our lives. But this is what I'm talking about. So last time I talked about unconditional faith. And we looked at the story of the three young guys in Daniel 3. I really love that story. Um, I asked a whole lot of questions. Um, they were uncomfortable questions, but I've got to say, I've never had as much feedback back on a message as two weeks ago. So you like to be challenged. Is that good? <laughs> it was this whole thing. These young guys, you know, face death. They make this declaration. They say, we know our God can deliver us from your power, King. This is their declaration. But the big thing, you know, we, we hammered on was, but even if he doesn't, and I ask the question, do you have a even if he doesn't kind of faith? And I found it challenging, and, I, and I'm glad you found it challenging because these are the questions we need to be unpacking. When things don't go how we feel they should go, is God still God? Is he still worth following? Is he still the one that we would model our life on? It's a big question. But what I want to do is I want to talk about another area, and this time it's unconditional fruit. Right? And, and it's a really cool topic. I, I smile because I know what's coming. All right? It's a really, really good thing, unconditional fruit. Um, and what I'm talking about is, is it's what's being produced in our lives. Any, any gardeners like fruit people here, like veggies and fruit? Come on. Spring's coming. Uh, my idea is just go to, the, to Woolies or Coles right? or Meredith's. I mean... That's my idea because I think my life's busy enough. I don't need to look after this stuff. But Andrea loves it. She loves growing things in the garden. I just grow weeds. Really good at it. Neglect, they prosper. It's probably a life message in that, actually. But I always say, you know, we put all of this effort into something, one particular crop, and when they're in season, you can buy like 100 for a dollar. See, that's the argument I always hear. They're not the same. But you hold them up next to each other? Yeah, they look pretty much the same to me. <laughs> I won't go there. But what I, want to, I just want to talk about this stuff that's being produced in our lives. But not only that, I want to talk about the fact that the stuff that's produced in our lives actually flows out. And it's what the world around us see. How we engage with people, how we engage in our normal life that kind of fruit as well. And I want to talk about this unconditional thing. So first thing I want to talk about is fruit flows from the condition of your heart. I don't want to make it personal. I don't want to have anything to do with this. It's your heart, not mine. I just know where I'm going. 
Matthew 7, Jesus, as he's teaching the masses, the Sermon on the Mount, um, they're all gathered on the hillside and he talks about uh, uh, this whole theme of false prophets. And he starts to unpack this. Um, and they're those who claim godliness, but their lives don't display godliness. You know, they're, they're, they're the ones that are kind of going, yes, look at me. And everyone's going, eh, I don't really see that. So he wants to draw attention to this. In verse 16, he says this, you can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. And Jesus asks the question to those listening. He said, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? He's trying to get them to think through. He's trying to explain that only good fruit can come from a good tree. And bad fruit comes from a bad tree. Now, I just want to say, we understand that no one's good. You might think you're good. Ask your partner. <laughs> Something. None of us are good, all right? So let's just put it out there. So we're not talking about perfection here. And it's not what God was talking about. Um, we're, we're understanding that, you know, Jesus is talking about our heart condition here. He's really trying to unpack this. Um, and, you know, we have scriptures, you know, from the overflow of our heart, our mouth speaks. Everything flows from this place, good and bad. Um, so when we start talking about unconditional fruit in our lives, um, we're really asking the question, what's the condition of your heart? And I want to unpack that a bit. So um, I started before that explaining while, you know, you may attend church, your, your outside actions, the way you behave might look like everyone else. But that doesn't mean that we have that dynamic relationship with Jesus. So I want to have a look at this. Now, it's a really big question around, you know, the condition of our heart. And I've quoted from gotquestions.org before. And I really like this website because it takes big thoughts and gives you a really cool, simple answer to them. So I just want to read what they wrote about this kind of thought. So often, people profess faith in Jesus as Saviour. But it's a mere profession with no real faith. Some religious groups encourage baptism, confirmation, or other religious rites that are supposed to ensure one's future in heaven. But as time goes on, the fruit being produced in such a life looks nothing like what is clearly prescribed in the Bible. Right, trying to pull this out. Some attend church services but spend the rest of their time living entirely for themselves. Some may rise to prominence, even teaching or preaching, writing books or dominating the media, but the fruit of their lives belies their words. They go on to say, greed, deception, immorality, pride or dishonesty defines them, making them false prophets by Jesus' standards. So now, now that's, that's pretty big, isn't it? We've seen in media, we've seen, we all probably have our own stories of that. And probably if we're honest, there's probably aspects of that that actually touches points in our own heart. And it does for me. So I'm just trying to be transparent with you. I look at this and I think, that's a big statement. We're not trying to point fingers. We're not trying to, I'm not trying to make you feel bad today. I'm just trying to say that we're all kind of in this space about the condition of our hearts. But let me say, this is really windy today. But let me say this, a good heart, all right, it's really hard not to get distracted, but every time I look at Anne, everything's going <laughs> like this. <laughs> let me say this one statement before we move on to point two, all right? A good heart isn't a perfect one. And I really want you to hear that. You don't have to be perfect to have a good heart. You just have to have a heart that's surrendered to Christ. And I think that's the big difference. Um, second thing is this, whether you realize it or not, do you know that you're producing fruit? I don't know if you ever thought about this before. Regardless of whether you're trying to, whether you're aware of it or not, you are producing fruit. The question is, is it good or is it bad? But we're constantly producing these things. Um, Galatians 5 is, one of, is a really cool passage of Scripture. And it actually talks about, and it gives this comparison of, of a good heart and a bad heart and the fruit that both produce. And I want to read you a few verses. Um, Again, I don't want to use this kind of term about someone who attends church or someone who has religious activities. You know, when we're talking about these kind of fruit, one is produced from those who don't know Christ and one is produced from those who do. So let me read um, verses 19 to 21. I was just checking. The door is open if someone wants to go shut it. That's amazing. 
our building breathes in the wind. It goes, <gasps> and then goes, <gasps> and everything that can open, opens. Are you right, Anita? It's an escape door. <laughs> I've got the thumbs up. So let me read verses 19 to 21. Um, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, right, hear that, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, this is a long list, okay? Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and just in case he missed any, <laughs> it's like if the list is not long enough, right? It says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, that is a massive, massive verse. Huge verse. Implications are massive. And one day, you know, we might have a talk about that verse. I don't want to talk about that verse today, but I just want to show you, you know, what Paul's trying to say is trying to say, that's the fruit that is produced of a heart that is not surrendered to God. But then he goes on. And in the next two verses, in verses, uh, verses 22 to 23, um, this is what he says, for those who belong to Christ, he says, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these, there's no law. You know, he says, there's, there's nothing that stands against these things. And they're a really good comparison and then in verse 24, Paul actually explains what the shift is, what changes it. And I want to just park on this for a sec. Verse 24 says this, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. All right? His cross and crucified them there. It's really interesting, this term, those who belong to Christ, because the, the, the reference is actually referring to um, being crucified with Christ. And as I was reading through some commentaries, one pointed out that it's, an act, it's actually an active voice, this verb. And it's meaning it's something that we do. So it's our responsibility to belong to Christ. If you unpack that a little bit more, it starts to talk about this. We belong to Christ because we have crucified our old desires and sinful nature. It becomes... Everyone's gone really quiet. It becomes our responsibility to put these things to death now the correct way to kind of understand this whole crucifying our old nature is simply by saying repentance it's this huge concept and all it is is us coming to a place where we acknowledge these things are wrong and we give them to god um, but it's a battle that's a daily battle i was thinking through my own life you know I'll, I'll god will bring something up and i'll go oh god i'm so sorry have this thing, and I'll give it to him. And we nail it to the cross. We crucify these old things in our life. But the problem is, I walk away, and then I go back and resurrect it again. You know what I mean? Instead of leaving it at the cross, instead of going, no, that thing is, that desire, that, that nature, that fruit, that's, that's been crucified with Christ. It no longer has any hold in my life. I go back to do CPR. You know, to grab the defib and I go, clear, oh yeah, let's pick this up again. God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to just leave those things there. They're contrary to what living for Christ is. Now, Paul explains that, uh, that as we belong to Christ, as we continue to live in this new nature, that the Holy Spirit produces fruit. And the word produce is a really kind of cool word. And, and these are the kind of words it, it means. It, he causes new fruit uh, he brings about he fosters i love the word he triggers so it's nearly saying that in you these things exist and the holy spirit just kind of brings them to life so the the, the root thing the foundation is in you for love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and gentleness all these things exist in you and he just triggers them to life as we sacrifice as we crucify our old nature um that's the second thing. The third thing, last point I want to talk about is, is, is it just really is brutally honest. Don't try to justify bad fruit. We, we regularly in our fruit bowl, regularly have 
a piece of off fruit. We do. You guys don't see it. Michaela, do we have rotten fruit in our fruit roll? Yeah, thank you. (laughs) You can pretend it's not there. But when you go to pick up something and when you grab it and it looks good on the outside and you grab it and it goes... You know where I'm at, don't you? Right? You can justify that all you want, but it's still bad fruit. It's only good for a smoothie for Michaela. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, we constantly try to do this. And, and in this point, you know, where I'm talking about the things that are old nature things, we could easily in our brain just justify that now and just excuse it away. You know, I, I was thinking, to you, you know, Mark, you don't know my past. You just don't understand. If you knew what I'd been through. You're with me, aren't you? Yeah. You know, if you had to deal with my fears, if you had to deal with my anger and my disappointment, you'd understand why I have bad fruit in my life. Bad fruit is bad fruit. And we've got to stop justifying it. Now, I am talking about me as much as I am about anyone else. So I'm not, I'm not chucking this out, letting it hit someone and going, <laughs> sucked in. Um, this hurts me as much as this guy, you know what I mean? Um, but I want to make these sort of statements. Don't allow your past to determine your future. Don't, just don't allow it. Um, allow God to make all things new in your life. How about how you start your day? Do you start your day with an expectation that's pulled from the past? This is just going to happen because it has before. Or do you actually start the day and go, my God is all-powerful. My God has a plan for my life. My God has provisions that I haven't even stepped into yet. He will protect me in every... Is that how we start our day? Because that is new nature versus old nature. Is that how we do it? These are the challenges, you know. Um, There's an example I just want to give you with this. You know, this whole thing that we have a choice. Um, I remember a few years back, I witnessed probably the worst conversation I've ever seen in my life. Just watched it play out in front of me where one person was just yelling and attacking another. All right? It was horrific to be in the middle of and just to sit and watch. And I went to address the yelly. I actually took them aside afterwards, lovingly and gently like I do, are you thinking <laughs> what is your problem you can't talk to people like that you know and I was really quite emotional about it and they turned around and their answer just absolutely rocked my world they said they said well I'm and put in a nationality and they said and that's how we do it and if you don't like it tough and I went really? And I said, I don't care what your nationality is or was. You're a child of God and you now live under his rules and his kingdom. And I think so often though, we live like this. We go, this is my old nature, so put up with it. But God says, but aren't you a child of mine? And the kingdom of God has different sets of rules around this. And you are powered and, and you are loved and you are, you are cared for. This all should be what starts flowing out of our lives. It really impacted me and it, and it challenged me. It challenged me on how I communicate. It challenged me on my mindsets. And, and I just want you, in a sense, to make a decision to get with the program. God wants to do something amazing in your life. And he wants to, in a sense, resurrect in you his character, his nature. He wants you to put to death all that stuff and just not make excuses for it anymore. Now, I've got to tell you, this is me as well. I'm on this journey too. I can get so angry sometimes and it's when I feel out of control or when things just aren't going how, you know, you feel like, it's not only like you feel disempowered. It all should be going this way or why isn't this happening? And, and, it's, and it's an excuse. Because in my life, I have love, joy, peace, patience, self control I have all of this, just like you. And my challenge is, let's get with what God wants to do in our lives. There's a passage of scripture, I think, which has always really impacted me from probably 
probably about two or three weeks into my Christian journey. And it's 1 John 1 9. And I want to read it from the Passion Translation. I've never read it from this, this, passage, uh, this translation before. It says, But if we freely admit our sins when his light uncovers them. That's a really interesting phrase. There's stuff that sits in our life that we're not aware of. I don't know if you've noticed that. Like, I'll do something and I go, Where did that come from? You know, it's nearly like a shock. Like, who did that? It wasn't, surely that wasn't me. God's light uncovers darkness in our life. And God wants to, to deal with it. It says when we admit it, when we repent, when we ask for forgiveness, he will be faithful to forgive us every time. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Not just once a week. It's not like we kind of gather them all up and then give it to him at the, on a Sunday morning. You know, He says every single time we come to him, he'll forgive us. God is just to forgive us our sins because of Christ and he will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's such an encouraging passage of scripture. It, it, it just, it brings us all into that same place. We're all even, we're all equal. Before God, we are loved, we are clean, we are seen as righteous. I think it's such an encouraging thing. So let me finish with this. The kind of fruit that's produced in our lives is totally our choice. I just want to put that out there. Whatever fruit is being developed in your life, it's, you've chosen to develop that. Whether it's our old nature or whether it's the Holy Spirit producing in us, it's still our choice. Have we crucified? Have we left our old nature with God? Now, it's not our parents' choice. We can't blame our family. It'd be nice if we could blame our family, but we can't blame our family. Um, it's not dictated to by our past and it's not driven by our circumstances. It's purely our choice. And I believe if we are those Christians, you know how we're talking before, not serious ones, but just Christians, then unconditional good fruit has to happen. The Holy Spirit is producing in us when we're connected to God, good fruit. So I guess the challenge today is, and it's a huge challenge, it's a huge challenge. Will we just not put up with bad fruit any longer? Like today, will we actually say, hey God, I'm just not going to have bad fruit anymore. Now, again, I'm not saying we have to be perfect. We're broken. We're sinful. There's stuff that happens. I get that. But we should be getting better. You know, if you've been a Christian for 50 years and you still have really bad fruit in your life, stop making excuses. Now it's quiet. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you react, if you, if you do things and you've done things and you've always done it this way, it's time to just stop. Yeah. Yeah. And can I explain why it's time to stop? And this challenge is for me, please. It's not, I'm not pointing like this. It's like, you know. The reason we need to stop is because people watch you and they look at your life. And we are Christ's ambassadors on earth. And we go around and we say to people, Jesus can fix that. Jesus can meet that need. Jesus can help you deal through the... If that's not happening in our own lives, you know, sometimes I'd like to prefer... I prefer to say, hey, look, I've only, I've only been a Christian for a day. <laughs> you, should, you should come to Jesus. He's amazing. Because then I go, yeah, I've been doing this thing for 30 years. And they look and I go, what? And you're still struggling with that? Why would I come to your God? And I think it's got nothing to do with God. <laughs> it's all to do with me. And it's just that thing we need to get to this point, unconditional fruit moving in our lives. Because when people see us, they don't have to see per perfect people. They just have to see this surrendered heart to God and see him working in our lives. Can I please pray for you that you would like me again? <laughs> I really felt it was a message that I had to share today and I had to go this way because I, I, just, I just want the best for you. And, and the best is God's best in our life. And uh, I, I love people, I really do, and I love talking with people. What I hate when I talk to people is when they keep hitting the same wall. And the same trap, the same thing keeps tripping them. When I know God has got an answer to that thing. So Father, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you... It's not that you just care about us. You know, it's not just like from a distance you go, oh, you know, God, you're engaged in our life. You're, you're just so 
um, in that space where you want to work and you want to move and you want to uh, heal and change and shift and bring the good into our life. And Lord, I, I thank you that you're active. I just pray today that we can take those things of our, our old nature and we can just leave them at, a cro- at the cross. We can say, Jesus, have these things and not go back to them. That Lord, you know, as it comes up again, you know, we again, we go, no, that's at the cross. And we continue to move into your season, into your grace in our lives. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the fruit that you trigger, you know, that sits in our life. We're all capable of achieving and and outworking. Lord, I thank you that you can do that. And I just pray, um, not, you know, it's like, God, give me patience. I don't want the experiences to test patience, but God, I want the fruit in my life. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want help with any of this, if you want to talk more, if you want prayer, please talk to someone you trust. That may not be me, and that's okay. But it might be someone. It might be your partner. It might be someone that you just have a really intimate relationship with, and you can say, hey, this is something. Can you pray with me and just agree with me and just keep me accountable? It might be a simple thing. But we're here to help each other, aren't we? Why? Because we're family. Yeah? Cool. We'll head out into the kitchen and grab a cuppa then. (laughs) But if you need prayer, love to pray for you. Oh, and don't forget Father's Day next week. I think there's a new Mitre 10 catalog.